basically, this is kind of, I think, a narrative of how I started my research career. Um, you know, to start, I think we're going to cover epidemiology, some volume outcomes, um, comparative effectiveness, technical modifications for radical prostatectomy briefly. Uh, and then I think many of you have heard about the PSA screening guidelines and uh, image guided diagnosis and treatment. So to start, you know, I think it's important to, it's, it's just like the old uh, Isaac Newton saying, you can see farther because you stood on the shoulder of giants. And, um, you know, I think um, I, like many of other people who went to Baylor for urology uh, medical school, like John Gore and Ganesh Palapatu was inspired to go into urology by Peter Scardino. And um, of course, Mark Litwin was the person who I spent my research year with at UCLA. Nancy Keating uh, helped me really as a mentor for my DOD. Dr. DeKernian was the chair at urology, of urology at UCLA. And uh, Dr. Walsh has been helpful just through with advice throughout my career. And Phil Kantoff was head of medicine at, um, or rather GU Medical Oncology at the Farber, which really allowed me to thrive uh, early in my career and referred me a lot of patients uh, and uh, helped a lot with uh, research advice and so forth. Um, the backdrop of this, of course, is that uh, prostate cancer, the incidence continues to go up after a dip uh, that's attributed to the guidelines and um, the number of deaths for prostate cancer has recently increased. Uh, the lifetime risk of prostate cancer diagnosis is one in eight. Uh, and the prevalence is currently over $3 million. And it's estimated that prostate cancer will count for about $21 billion uh, in terms of healthcare spending. And um, during my research here, uh, we were looking at, you know, there was a lot of papers that were coming out about how higher volume would lead to better outcomes. And uh, the SEER, SEER recently, the, the National Tumor Registry that the NCI sponsors, had uh, in a couple of years prior merged uh, with the Medicare database. Um, and so SEER Medicare really was a relatively new thing uh, when during my research year and uh, Dr. Scardino and his group, Colin Begg, who's now the head of uh, statistics. And again, you can see some of the, the names on here. Deb Schrag was uh, at Memorial, went to the Farber, now is back as head of medicine actually to replace Phil. Um, but uh, essentially they looked at hospital volume and surgeon volume as quartiles here uh, for radical prostatectomy and showed that there was a, a de decrease for an instance. And if you looked at surgeon volume, the very high surgeon a court volume quartile had 26% complications. The, the low uh, volume surgeons had 32% complications. So again, showing that there, the higher volume uh, surgeons as well as higher volume hospitals had uh, fewer complications. And they also looked at, for example, late urinary complications uh, incontinence, 20% versus 28%. And so essentially, we, we didn't have SEER Medicare at the time, but uh, we had the 5% Medicare file. And uh, that paper came out and kind of scooped what we were trying to do. And so, um, and, and again, with a 5% Medicare sample, and Medicare, of course, is covering most men age 65 years and older, um, we looked at really the same thing, that is hospital surgeon, and hospital and surgeon volume, but when you put it in the same multivariable analysis, which um, the Memorial folks didn't do, we found that at least hospital volume was no longer a significant driver of in-hospital complications, strictures, and lengths of stay for radical prostatectomy, which makes sense as we've had to, as, as particularly during the pandemic, move to doing uh, the radical prostatectomies as an outpatient, where really there's no influence of hospital volume except the recovery room, right? And so. So if you look at this, and we, we, we just looked at high versus low volume and kind of stratified it. Uh, we took the 5% sample and looked at a distribution and then really multiplied it by, by 20 since it was a, a, a rather uh, small sample. And uh, again, high volume surgeons were half as likely to experience inpatient complications. But the point of this is the exposure, um, and again, just saying that uh, hospital volume here is no longer significant. But the exposure to this um, was really helpful, actually, serendipitously. Mark um, and Ari had trained at the Brigham. And uh, I think when you look for jobs, as you will see, these types of relationships are helpful amongst your mentors. And when I went to Boston, for example, in 2005, these, were, these two studies were cited as the rationale for posting uh, radical prostatectomy surgeon volumes on the state website. And this was then picked up by the Boston Globe. Uh, and uh, at, at the time, you can see that Frank McGovern, which act, who's actually voluntary faculty and still is at the MGH, was doing the most number of radical prostatectomies in Boston uh, 
at 154 a year. And, uh, and uh, you, you can see also the other surgeries in which there was a volume outcomes relationship that uh, the Globe had published. Um, but just for perspective, I think as the robot came along, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, these volumes, I think, shifted from open to, to, to minimally invasive surgery surgeons, and you know the volumes were much higher. Uh, using that same sample, we then looked at some other things. I mean, it'd be difficult for, I think, most trainees these days to imagine that back in 1991, the mean length of stay for radical prostatectomy was, was eight days. And even in 1998, it was about 5.1 days. Um, and then we looked at some of the trends over time in terms of in-hospital complications, incontinence, impotence, as well as anastomotic strictures. But the point, again, is that during my research here, having had some exposure to uh, you know, claims-based data or secondary database analysis using CPT codes and so forth. Uh, you know, this, this really kind of set me up to do some of this analysis really for the rest of my career. Um, one of the other things that I looked at that uh, Mark uh, had going on, he'd had his, now it's an $80 million uh, grant from the state of California looking at really prostate cancer care in the, the indigent or those below the poverty line. And so a lot of these men were throughout the state were given uh, quality of life questionnaires. Uh, really, Mark had come up with the UCLA Prostate Cancer Index, which has subsequently been modified to the expanded prostate cancer index and so forth. And so really working with um, uh, patient reported outcomes, we, we just looked at some of these uh, outcomes such as regret. And one of the things that uh, I'll always remember about this paper uh, is that initially the editors actually rejected this uh, this, this paper, and then Mark wrote a letter saying that, look, this is uh, worthwhile to publish, and, and fortunately, uh, they, the editors reconsidered, and uh, I think this has been cited now close to 98 times. Uh, but again, having some experience with looking at patient-reported outcomes uh, was also very helpful, as, as that's been a critical part of looking at new treatments and what the effect is on urinary and sexual function. Um, this was the cover for U.S. News & World Report back in August 2009. Uh, at which time uh, one can see that uh, the robot was really uh, more and more common. And um, as a result, uh, you can probably associate hospital quality with having to have a robot with, with that particular cover. Um, and in, news, in 2005, Newsweek also published an article in which they, um, they, they, they claimed that the robotic surgery had better cancer removal, faster removal of the catheter, shorter complications you can see as compared to open laparoscopic and, and robotic surgery, also showing the markedly less uh, blood loss. Um, and, um, you know, for those familiar with Boston, this is just a billboard outside of Fenway Park uh, when uh, uh, Harry Turk or Ingolf Turk moved to from uh, Leahy Clinic to, to, uh, to the St. Elizabeth system, they put up a billboard uh, really promoting robotic surgery. So there was a lot of direct to -con consumer advertising. Uh, and fortunately, I had, you know, chosen to do a fellowship at City of Hope, which was really doing laparoscopic prostatectomies at the time, but uh, converted to robotic prostatectomy. And, um, and you can see in this paper that we wrote, we, we kind of compared the complication rates and um, outcomes. But, you know, the editors actually asked us to take out the p-values. Um, you know, you can kind of understand the politics of this at the time when uh, actually robotic prostatectomy accounted for probably less than 10% of all prostatectomies at that time. And then uh, they wanted us to put in these, these other open series as well as laparoscopic series and, and just let the reader really run their eyes over this table to make those comparisons. Um, at the time as well, I remember the intuitive stock price was about $15 and now adjusted for the multiple splits. I had dinner with um, John Brentnell, who's the head of their academic program. Now adjusted for splits, I think it's up to $2,600. So it just shows you what a force intuitive surgery has been. And then using some of those, that skill set from, um, from residency training, as well as uh, the now Sear Medicare, largely some of the same outcomes. This was really the, the main product of my career, de career development award at the Brigham with Nancy Keating. Uh, and, um, and essentially, we just showed that the uptake of robotic surgery, and this is largely robotic, although the CPT code 55866 captures the laparoscopic approach as well, but one can see the, the marked uh, increase uh, accounting for approximately 40% of radical prostatectomies in 2006-2007. Uh, in uh, and uh, I mean, some of the key outcomes here were just that the length of stay was a day shorter. Um, blood transfusion rates, you can see almost 10 times lower. Uh, 
and uh, some of the other miscellaneous medical surgical complications, as well as stricture rates were much lower, 5.8% versus 14%. Uh, and this was kind of the controversial piece. That is, we looked at the diagnosis of erectile dysfunction and uh, incontinence using Medicare claims, which, of course, is not a great proxy for, um, for patient-reported outcomes. But we found that uh, men who underwent minimally invasive or, and uh, surgery as well as had, had a greater likelihood of incontinence and erectile dysfunctions as compared to open radical prostatectomy. And uh, again, so that was the first population-based comparison of the two approaches. Um, the, the limitations of uh, administrative data are uh, the absence of granularity, that is characteristics about the patient, the surgeon, the technique. Uh, for example, nerve sparing isn't captured in CPT codes. Uh, I mentioned the absence of patient reported outcomes as well as long-term cancer control outcomes are, are uh, absent. And so um, I always kind of use this, it's a funny slide just because it says a parachute reduced the risk of injury uh, after gravitational challenge, but their effectiveness has not been proven with uh, randomized controlled trials. So in the same way, in urology, we d adopt a lot of things without randomized controlled trials, for example, robotic-assisted surgery, and one really had to wait until, um, I think this was about 2016, when uh, a single, sin single center randomized control came out in The Lancet, and uh, this was a comparison uh, with uh, John Yaxley, who was one of Viv Patel's fellows, and uh, Robert Gardner is an experienced open surgeon, and they compared uh, through a randomized control trial their retropubic and the robotic series. And really, some of the outcomes you can see are, are largely the same. However, here the the robotic surgery duration was actually less, um, the uh, blood loss obviously markedly less, and um, and you can see that from the patient reported outcomes, I think the main thing to take away is that in terms of urinary and sexual function, postoperatively, there's no difference in urinary and sexual function. However, uh, they did show that at 24 hours in one week, that the robotic assisted surgery had lower pain scores um, as compared to retropubic. The higher scores here indicate uh, more pain. And so um, the limitations of that particular randomized control trial, is it generalizable uh, when you have a, a, a relatively younger surgeon a few years out of fellowship uh, comparing his outcomes to an older surgeon. And again, uh, the, the heterogeneity in surgeon technique and outcomes may be limited in, in these types of comparisons. And then, uh, you know, when do you conduct a randomized control trial along a surgeon's experience? Um, in contrast, for example, the population-based studies uh, give an uh, average of the outcomes. And um, the cancer control outcome was also a, a question I remember in Boston, Jerry Ritchie was my boss, who was an open surgeon, and um, he and Anthony D'Amico wanted to compare the, the positive surgical margin rates after open versus robotic, and uh, my positive surgeon uh, rates were higher. So then we asked the question, uh, what is the uh, cancer control outcome for robotic versus open surgery, at least on a population-based level? And um, essentially, the, the as you can see here, um, the uh, positive surgical margin rate for robotic surgery was 13.6% versus 18.3%. And again, in a tumor registry, uh, you can collate all those outcomes just from the, the radical prostatectomy pathology report. And additionally, we looked at the likelihood of getting uh, radiation therapy at 12 and 24 months, which again are, are uh, hard endpoints just because you can capture those with CPT codes, of course. And um, we found that uh, the robotic surgery, you can see here that the, the odds ratio was 0.73 as well as 0.67, as showing less likelihood to get radiation therapy at least within 12 and 24 months. Um, going to the task force guidelines, which I've shown in previous talks, one of the things, of course, um, when you go through this is, and, and you look at it, a thousand men get screened. Um, of those who get a positive PSA result, uh, they, they undergo a biopsy. These 100 men, of those 100 men, 80 may choose surgery radiation therapy. And of those 80, 50 out of 80 may exp exp will experience erectile dysfunction, 15 out of 80 experience um, uh, urinary incontinence. And so if you're a man looking at this, I think it makes you very, number one, unlikely to get PSA screening. And number two, the uh, morbidity of treatment is, of course, quite high. Uh, and Andrew Vickers, of course, showed, uh, and this was published back in 2011, when there were 11 surgeons at Memorial Sloan Kettering doing urinary and sexual, uh, doing radical prostatectomy, he, you could see the wide range in urinary and sexual function outcomes. That is, for example, uh, a person, a surgeon that um, 
operates number surgeon number nine, for example, had a 50% uh, preservation of erectile function at 12 months, whereas um, surgeon number three, that was less than 10%. And so, so we're just showing you the large differences that uh, uh, intraoperative techniques uh, and surgeon heterogeneity has on variation in outcomes as well. And so certainly, um, and that's again, using the patient reported outcomes as, as having experience doing that in residency and sending out those surveys, uh, I've been able to look at uh, patient reported outcomes after various technical modifications. Uh, and uh, that's also helped a large part uh, thinking about new techniques and operations and how to, how to uh, quantify differences, which we'll come back to. Just as, as an, just as an example, uh, we also looked at bladder cancer, for example, with the nationwide inpatient sample. That's different from uh, Medicare. It covers all uh, women and men of all ages uh, across the U.S. Um, and um, when we compared robotic to open radical cystectomy, for example, um, there were no deaths uh, during that particular admission for robotic versus 2.5% for open. Uh, you can see here again the, the inpatient complication rate about 49% versus 64% favoring robotic surgery. Uh, the use of TPN during that hospital admission was 6.4% versus 13.3%. Uh, the, the NIS or nationwide inpatient sample also captures uh, charges, and you can see that the, there were, the charges for robotic surgery was about 4,000 times higher. Now, again, this is a population based comparison. Uh, and then Bernie Bachner across the street. Uh, who's an outstanding surgeon trained with Don Skinner, did a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine and um, basically showed that there was really no difference in robotic-assisted versus open radical cystectomy, at least at MSK. And you can see that the, the difference in operative time was almost or was over two hours for the robotic surgery. Uh, Lengths of stay were the same uh, at eight days each. There was, a, and then Depend Perec, of course, uh, had one of these uh, challenge grants funded during uh, the, the Recovery Act by uh, Barack Obama, and uh, he did a randomized control trial multi-center, and you can see uh, the challenges in enroll enrolling to surgical randomized control trials, that is uh, 150 in each arm. However, in this multi-center randomized control trial, the, the blood loss was markedly less, 300 versus 700 cc's. The transfusion rate, you can see here, again, uh, 24 versus 45 percent, markedly lower. Uh, intraoperative transfusion rates also lower, and um, in, at least here, the, the difference in operative time uh, wasn't as uh, uh, significant or, or vast as it was over at Memorial. Um, I've shown this before, so I'm not going to belabor this too much, but basically just showing that with the advent of PSA screening, uh, the likelihood of metastasis and diagnosis decreased significantly, whereas for breast cancer, uh, there was really no difference in metastasis diagnosis with the introduction of uh, mammography. And uh, that speaks to the fact that many breast cancers are probably like these hummingbirds. That is, they, they, before, when you diagnose them, there may already be symptoms uh, before the screening detects the cancer. Whereas with prostate cancer, as we know for low risk disease, you really wanna avoid diagnosing the, sl the, the sna snails and the turtles because these really, you, you screen and detect cancer, but they may never cause symptoms, they don't cause death and therefore you're, you're contributing to uh, poor quality, quality of life in this, these men and subjecting them to anxiety as well as future PSAs and prostate biopsies. Uh, this just also shows that the number of deaths uh, for prostate cancer have decreased uh, here since the advent of PSA in the early 1990s. Uh, the two trials, of course, uh, that led to the task force recommendation against PSA screening, uh, the ERSPC, was, which was positive, um, However, uh, the number needed to screen at that time was 1,440 to save one man from prostate cancer. The PLCO, uh, there was no change. Uh, and based on these two trials that were published in 2009, the, the task force were recommended against uh, PSA screening, giving it a grade D recommendation. Um, and uh, at the time when this was published, the PLCO was published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it was said that the, the um, contamination during the study uh, was about uh, uh, 52%, that is 52% of men had some sort of PSA testing during that, the six years to which they were randomized to annual PSA testing. Um, this then uh, was met with a, a lot of controversy. Bill Catalona, who actually did a lot of work, published in New England Journal of Medicine uh, in the early 1990s, the benefit of PSA screening, uh, uh, kind of took the uh, approach that uh, this this uh, really was a incorrect guideline. And then you can see Otis Browley, who was then, 
head of the American Cancer Society, quoted Upton Sinclair uh, and said, uh, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. So kind of implicating that urologists um, uh, are going to have a difficult time with this because PSA and prostate cancer biopsies and so forth are such a large portion of the practice that we do. Uh, working with Yoni uh, and uh, Josh and others, uh, we looked at, uh, and Chris is also an author on this paper, we looked at after the, the guidelines, the, the significant decrease in the proportion of primary care visits where there was a PSA that was drawn as well as a prostate exam that was performed. Um, and so you can see that the task force recommendations had a, a significant effect. And particularly when you look across ages, you can see the shift from the green curve to the blue curve. That is, uh, again, uh, across ages, there was a decline in the, the uh, use of PSA testing during those visits. Um, uh, Josh and I also then looked at the, uh, the using American Board of Urology data, as well as um, the uh, SPARCS database, which looks at New York State only. We looked at the decline in prostate biopsy volumes, as well as uh, radical prostatectomy volumes, comparing the three years prior to the task force recommendations versus the three years after. And one can see the prostate biopsy volumes decreased by 30%, radical prostatectomy volumes decreased by 16%. Uh, and then we also note that the indication for prostate biopsies increased for active surveillance, although the overall number of biopsies decreased by about a third. Um, then Ted actually published this uh, with, uh, with Rick, uh, uh, Rich Malchowicz, who's now over at uh, Memorial, and uh, they looked at the National Cancer Database uh, and, and they claimed that the likelihood of metastasis uh, was increasing, uh, shown here. And they, they you know, Chris, uh, rather Ted being a, the, the chair at Northwestern, of course, uh, had relatively greater ease in getting out a, a press release about this in 2016, uh, just five years ago, actually, if you think about it, and uh, was immediately criticized that study. In fact, for the New York Times to publish something that the, the flawed, uh, it's a flawed study of advanced prostate cancer that uh, spreads false alarm. Um, and, um, and one of the major criticisms was that the National Cancer Database is a really a collection of uh, hospitals that, that are part of that coalition that, that report numbers. And that differs from, for example, SEER, uh, which is really a population-based um, red tumor registry uh, that comprises or represents about 28% of the U.S. population. And so that was the main criticism. This just shows you the maps about the, the, the SEER the areas cover basically all of California now. Uh, New York State, as of uh, 2020, uh, 20 was also became a SEER registry state. Um, and again, this, this was such a controversial paper that there was also another uh, refutation of um, the, um, the, the, the findings uh, from this National Association uh, rather from, from this, uh, this, this, again, this, this press release. And so, so I think the other, you can see Otis Browley here and Jamal and, and Siegel are, are really the people from the CDC that put out the, the annual incidence and mortality of different cancers in the United States. And they published in JAMA uh, that essentially when you looked at these 2006 to 2012, the likelihood of local regional and uh, distant disease that there was no significant difference in presentation of prostate cancer as a result of the task force recommendation or the decline in PSA screening. However, uh, when I looked at this, you know, you can think of local regional disease here, at, at least for prostate cancer, this represents N1 disease, that is regional disease uh, and uh, local, re actually they combine local and regional, but regional disease at least is just N1 disease and T3 disease, that is either extracapsular extension or seminal vesicle invasion. And of course, those are very different disease states, uh, and um, and that's a use a result of using uh, summary staging uh, in SEER. And there is what's called collaborative staging. Uh, but before I get to that, the other interesting footnote here is that, of course, um, Ben Stiller was was Ted's patient when he was at Hopkins, and uh, Ben, I think, um, really, I think, came out against the wave and and uh, and had press releases that prostate cancer saved his life. Um, some of you who know the, the movie Something About Mary, of course, that he's been in. Uh, he also wrote a piece in Medium uh, that talked about how PSA saved his life. He had a radical prostatectomy at age 48 and with uh, 3 plus 4 equals 7. And so um, what, what we did essentially was that we looked at collaborative staging, which captures uh, N1 disease, and we, we grouped uh, N1 disease and uh, 
distant metastasis. And when we did that, we found that at least in the older, pop, older, older men, the likelihood of metastasis to diagnosis was actually increasing. Um, and, um, and part of that is that the task force recommended against PSA screening uh, in older men uh, back in 2008, uh, before that was extended to men of all ages uh, in 2012. We also then looked at the SEER registry, which captures, as I mentioned earlier, radical prostatectomy pathology specimens at diagnosis. And you can see here that if you looked at lymph node metastasis and RP, this increased from 2.4% to 5.9% in 2013. Um, and uh, that was in men less than 75 and men older than 75. That was a more pronounced increase. That is from 1.6% to 9.6%. And, um, and of course, but one could say that as we had greater adoption of active surveillance, which in 2013 was not that widespread, uh, there could be selection bias in terms of who urologists are operating on nationally. I mean, for example, certainly we're operating on more high-risk disease now as compared to um, previously. And so um, we, we then just showed that this uh, increase in metastasis continued to have effect beyond 2012-2013. Uh, Yoni's work, of course, uh, was looking at how the, the uh, the folks that published the PLCO defined um, contamination, and it was really defined with this questionnaire that is, if someone answered um, one to two years or two to three years before for your most PSA, recent PSA, or that the main reason for the PSA test was, um, was uh, for a follow-up to a previous health problem, or as screening is mainly, that is part, part of a routine exam, that they did not consider this contamination. But when when one accounted for those things and uh, re redefined what the contamination is, you can see that that this really appro approximated uh, almost 90% uh, in the PLCO study. So that is men who were randomized to no PSA testing, approximately 90% of them had some sort of PSA testing during this study. Uh, so we also know that there could be recall bias. That is uh, when, when men were uh, examined and uh, questioned whether they had screening or, or not, uh, in a separate study, they're more likely to underreport that they had screening, so that true number probably is much higher. Um, in terms of, um, I think the culmination of some of that work uh, was actually the impetus for the task force changing their recommendation back from a grade D to grade C. Uh, and um, again, going back to this infographic, when one looks at the benefit uh, from screening and you see that, well, five men die from prostate cancer anyway, despite any sort of treatment, uh, one may avoid death from prostate cancer, three avoids uh, cancer spreading to other organs. Again, that's a very, I think, a very um, not optimistic view of PSA screening. And really, the task force took the, the outcomes of the ERSPC at about 11 years to come up with this infographic. Uh, so one of the things that we did more recently with uh, Roman Galati and Ruth Etzioni, who are the top uh, modeling folks for prostate cancer, was to extend, to try to uh, project using a conservative model, what at 25 years the, the benefit of PSA screening would be. And so I mentioned earlier at nine years, the number needed to screen was 1,440. Uh, you can see that that drops down to 385. The number of excess diagnosis comes down to 11. But this also speaks to screening uh, or using PSA in, in healthy younger men. Just for comparison, because I used that Gilbert Welch figure earlier looking at breast cancer, one can see that uh, these numbers, the number needed to screen at least, compare very favorably to breast cancer. Uh, and mammography currently enjoys a grade B recommendation from the US Preventative Services Task Force. Uh, understanding, of course, the follow-up here is much longer because the natural history of the two cancers uh, differ uh, significantly. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip this, but it just shows a, a epidemiologist who also mentioned we have good uh, screening techniques, but um, and treatment techniques, but screening isn't being uh, used widely. Uh, getting now to this infographic, which again, I think is a nice way to talk about some of the, the controversies and, and points of improvement. Uh, with prostate biopsy, of course, we know about pain and discomfort. Uh, transrectal biopsy, I think, still accounts for approximately 97% of the approach for biopsies in the US. And of course, each time that biopsy needle goes from the rectum into the prostate, it translo translocates rectal flora. Uh, and um, this white paper from the AUA published in, uh, I think, 2017 demonstrated that the risk of infection is about 5 to 7 percent, hospitalization 1 to 3 percent. These strategies that uh, were cited uh, were, were really a transperineal approach, which up to then was largely under general anesthesia, um, uh, rectal culture or targeted prophylaxis before the biopsy, 
as well as augmented prophylaxis, which most of us use. And um, this just gives you a, a, a schematic of a transperineal biopsy, which of course is percutaneous, therefore a, a clean procedure. In fact, the uh, Society for Interventional Radiology states that any percutaneous procedure actually does not need uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. And in 20, 2009, uh, a Japanese urologist published this uh, block using uh, local anesthesia where you really look for the levator muscles and uh, you inject anesthesia after a topical block uh, going through this lidocaine and inject uh, filling up this periapical space with lidocaine, which is what used, which has worked quite well. And uh, Michael Gorin published his series of, uh, of trans transperineal biopsies using this precision point device uh, before he left Johns Hopkins. Uh, and uh, this is more of a cognitive fusion approach. I think the limiting factor here, we talked about CPT codes earlier, for example, if you were try going to try to look at uh, outcomes using Medicare, you, you could not do that because uh, the transperineal approach currently does not have its own CPT code. And this device, uh, disposable device costs about, or they charge you $200 per use, uh, which is difficult for urologists to adopt because they're not getting reimbursed at a higher rate. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the precision study, uh, which uh, demonstrated that um, a third of men roughly, or 28% could avoid a biopsy with an elevated PSA and a normal MRI, uh, that the detection of targeted biopsies was 12% higher, 38 versus 26%, and finding fewer uh, indolent uh, prostate cancers, that is the, the, the turtles and the, uh, the snails, 9 versus 22%, really uh, favoring the use of MRI for elevated PSA. And, um, and again, that, that study has affected pro uh, guidelines now, the EAU and more recently, the AUA now advocates the use of MRI prior to a biopsy. Um, you know, Sue and uh, Dr. Vickers and I did some work where we really used the back of an envelope calculation and said, look, if the cost of MRI, it ranges uh, from $650 to $250. $600 is actually, if you use time-driven activities-based costing, that's the actual cost of an MRI. But if every man got a MRI, uh, MRI prior to a biopsy, and this number, a million, has been cited widely, which more recently uh, someone found to be a pretty accurate representation, that would add $3 billion to healthcare costs annually. And we know that um, and there's inexperience in the community. We talked about the importance of uh, volume and outcomes. Uh, and also, even amongst high volume uh, hospitals, there's significant variation in, in what uh, radiologists define as uh, PIRADs. Uh, fours and fives, and that was a nice paper that Jeff Son published at Stanford. Um, I've spoken before about looking at um, uh, racial variation. For example, uh, you know Marcus Liu and others refer a lot of patients, Asian American patients, and when we looked at outcomes and we pulled our findings with uh, Stanford as well as UCLA, we found that Asian American men, for example, for PIRADS 3 and PIRADS 4 disease, when you look at clinically significant disease, that is grade group 2 or higher, it's markedly lower than non-Asian men, 12 versus 21% for PIRADS-3, 39 versus 48%. So likely reflecting a different um, uh, risk of or epidemiology uh, for prostate cancer in that population uh, coming more recently from Asia. So the, the biopsy work really led to the um, R01 being funded as a multi-center study. Uh, one of the things that I take away from this that give advice for others is that, you know, your, your grants, at least... Uh, beyond the career development award level are based on the strength of your investigators, the uh, environment that is your institutions, the innovation, as well as the approach, how, how sound is the approach uh, uh, methodologically. And of course, going in with top people at top institutions uh, helps that a lot. Um, I know that uh, Rich recently sent out uh, an email to encourage all the, the third year residents to apply for that uh, urology, urology Care Foundation grant. And so when you write these grants, you know, the specific aims page, and I, I'm sure Chris can attest to this as can Dory, um, that's really the most important thing. You, you, sitting down and writing these very simple sentences in a concise way that's easy to understand uh, takes a lot of time and many different uh, revisions. Uh, and, and this is just an example, at least, of the aims for, for this particular grant. We applied for that at the same time as a PCORI grant and uh, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute and uh, was funded for both. But in order to get funding for both, we tweaked the indication a little bit. The R01 is for um, uh, first-time biopsies. We changed this to active surveillance and prior negatives, really through a lot of communications uh, with the, with the, um, with PCORI, we're able to get this funded for a different indication, adding the University of Michigan. Um, 
going back to the, the, the harms of treatment, uh, it's heavily advertised here in the in New York area, uh, Cyber and I for SBRT, and you can see how this has changed from conventional dosing, or this is called hypofractionation, although the daily dose that you're giving um, is a much higher dose than, say, conventional radiation therapy. Um, and one can see that typically uh, IMRT, for example, you needed treatment for seven or eight weeks for prostate cancer. This is now decreased down to four to five. It's over a really a two week duration for CyberKnife. And certainly it can be very attractive to men. You can see how this is marketed direct to consumer. Um, this is from one of the websites where there's mention of high tech cruise missile guidance technology as computer controlled robotics and really echoes some of the things that were said about um, uh, robotic surgery early on. Uh, this is just a schematic for the different ways of uh, treating prostate cancer. Every time I put this up, I'm reminded of a comment uh, at the FDA when we had a meeting there where um, someone, Louis Jock, said, um, you know, the prostate's like the chicken McNugget. You can fry it. You can, you can uh, microwave it. You can freeze it. And just illustrating the different approaches we have to doing that. And this just illustrates a partial gland ablation, which we're doing based on that transperineal uh, lidocaine block. Uh, in office, which I think, um, again, is, is going to be where the future of treatment is. Um, really, in 2015, the, the FDA, along with the SUO and the AUA, had a uh, uh, workshop for patients. This was in New Orleans, and uh, this was the patient voice. That is, they, they felt that uh, partial gland ablation would be a promise from heaven. Uh, many men were traveling overseas uh, to get their treatments done in, in, say, Mexico or in Canada or Europe. And that pressure really led to um, the FDA giving uh, partial gland ablation, that is um, high intensity focused ultrasound, a ablation indication. So it doesn't have a cancer indication, uh, but and cannot be marketed for uh, cancer, but it being used for uh, ablation for prostate cancer tissue more widely. So a recent systematic review, this was just published, uh, looked at the current state of the evidence for prostate cancer focal therapy. Uh, looked through all of these, it started with 1,559 articles, and really just came up with four studies that met its inclusion criteria, which was that, you know, it had to be a comparative study of more than 50 per arm, comparing it to focal therapy. Their, their, their findings were that the vast majority of studies were small, uncontrolled. Uh, there were serious methodological flaws, heterogeneity in the populations. And this just shows uh, using the, 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 the red, yellow, and green, red had a high risk of bias, yellow uh, was uh, indeterminate because of insufficient evidence, green, the risk of bias was low. And so you can see this was the study in which that there was the least bias was a randomized control trial that was industry funded, initially published in Lancet that compared photodynamic uh, therapy uh, using uh, a, a vascular targeted agent. Uh, and, and this was really with the control, this was in men with Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Um, and then there was a uh, series comparing to radical prostatectomy, 50 versus 50. And these studies were actually SEER studies looking at laser ablation, which had, is captured in SEER, and survival outcomes within five to 10 years, which of course, not many people are going to die from prostate cancer. But that's the reason why those two studies made it into this final four, for example. Um, the authors concluded, well, you know, do we really want to treat low-risk prostate cancer? Because it's unlikely that men will ever die from this, but, but treatment will certainly have transient side effects. Uh, so that is the most recent 2021 review, and uh, Peter and I uh, were fortunate, uh, Dr. Schlegel and I were fortunate to be part of this uh, multi-group, uh, multi-specialty uh, think tank, really, at the FDA for, for the oncology group, ODAC, uh, and trying to think about a study design in which, uh, really, a, a device or an agent could get uh, a prostate cancer indication. And this is the current paradigm that the FDA uh, is advocating, which I think is somewhat flawed. I actually had uh, breakfast, excuse me, with uh, Lenny Marks uh, Saturday, and uh, Jonathan Feinberg joined us briefly. But but you know, Lenny is, has a laser device that he's trying to get FDA approval for with Eric Klein and Scardino on his ad board, um, and and their uh, control arm is active surveillance, which I think you know, frankly, again, as the European urology folks demonstrated, I'm not sure that that is the correct um, uh, control arm. Although we've seen how, you know, the thinking about prostate cancer is really somewhat of a moving target. Uh, and so at least for now, that's the, uh, that's what they are looking at. This just shows in contrast, uh, Bernie Fisher was a really a giant in uh, the field of uh, uh, breast cancer surgery because he did the randomized control trials that have shown that um, there's no difference in, in disease-free survival, metastasis-free survival, uh, 
as well as overall survival for a partial mastectomy versus radical mastectomy. And again, that may get back to the fundamentally different um, tumor biology that you saw earlier in which partial mastectomy had a rather the advent of mammography had no effect on uh, breast cancer uh, mortality long term. Uh, and, and really, Bernie Fisher, the paradigm that's been credited to him is that cancers do not need to uh, spread in a predictable fashion, for example, for breast to the, the axillary lymph nodes. That was really the Halstead model, uh, which was thought of for years that there is this predictable pattern of spread, whereas his, his for the mastectomy and the uh, mammography, rather the partial mastectomy and the mammography example is that uh, breast cancer can spread hematogenously, hematogenously uh, through the blood um, in a less predictable fashion. So where this applies, at least in prostate cancer, is that, you know, um, Hash Ahmed and, and really uh, Andrew is the one, Vickers is the one that pointed out this, um, this think tank that uh, got together in the UK. And at the time, this was uh, published in 2014, uh, Hash was thinking about how can we do a randomized control trial for focal therapy and looked at all the randomized control trials that have had occurred uh, for prostate cancer and showed that many of them failed because of lack of uh, physician equipoise or patient equipoise. And you can see why that may be the case because of all the direct and consumer advertising that uh, occurs and the fact that urologists diagnose prostate cancers, but and also can refer to radiation oncologists um, in, a, in a sometimes biased fashion. So, so using time-driven activities-based costing, we, we were able to get this into JAMA where we basically said, look, if you looked at the true cost of care, um, if someone failed uh, HIFU partial gland ablation and subsequently had therapy, of course, that cost is going to be significantly higher. And that had relevance because uh, in, in some health systems like UCLA, for example, there's the embracement of um, an accountable care organization where one is looking at value throughout the system, value defined as outcomes divided by cost of care. Um, this then led to our um, funding, our, our, our study looking at uh, different treatments for prostate cancer. And as I mentioned on Friday, one of the things when you think about these grants, um, which, is, uh, which is very important, is to think about the acronym. For example, in this, we called it PC Concept. You know, sometimes just having a catchy acronym is important to, to uh, stick in the minds of the, the review committee. But essentially, this is a population-based study where we're collecting um, outcomes on men with Gleason 6 and Gleason 7 prostate cancers that are undergoing really the contemporary treatments for prostate cancer SBRT or CyberKnife, IMRT, conventional radiation therapy, partial gland ablation, radical prostatectomy, and um, active surveillance. And so this is a three-year grant in which we've got approximately eight or nine uh, months under our belt now in terms of enrollment. Uh, but, but very similar to what David Pinson did with um, CSER, for example, or the prostate cancer outcome study, which were all based on SEER registries. And, and uh, Ron Chen and I, Ron is the, um, is the uh, editor-in-chief of uh, JNCI, um, what is it, Spectrum, as well as the chair of radiation oncology at um, University of Kansas. But he also had a cohort study, NC Process, that was published in JAMA at the same time the CSER study was published. Um, so Ron and I are going to think about how to uh, capture long-term outcomes, that is cancer control outcomes, through, the, through submitting an R01 next year. So again, I spoke of the importance of really refining your specific aims. Uh, here you see them here. Uh, and um, and that is really, you know, when, when you have grant review committees, you have probably a handful of people who are actually going to read the grant. That is two or three, the primary reviewers. Then you have the other folks on the panel who are going to sit around and uh, vote at the end based on uh, how um, convincing some of the reviewers are or unfortunately how uh, unconvincing or critical they are. And so really they, the, the other the majority of the folks that are going to vote on your grant uh, are going to just read the specific aims, which again speaks to the importance of really refining uh, that part of the grant. Um, I'm just going to end, let's see, it's um, 7.48, so we have a little bit more time. But uh, I'll talk a little bit, and, and not to uh, steal Keith's thunder when he comes back, but I'll talk, talk a little bit about um, technical modifications for urinary continence in a second. But um, this study actually uh, was um, with uh, Andrew and the Memorial folks in which one of my uh, former nurse practitioners, um, Caroline Green, and I really noticed that it seemed like Asian American men had um, worse urinary function after radical prostatectomy. And so we pulled data with Memorial. And uh, when we did that, in fact, we did find that the odds ratio of achieving continence was 
for um, Asian American men versus um, uh, versus non-Asian American men. And you can see that because of the, the the proportion of Asians at Memorial was smaller, but because of the larger sample size, this was a, a tighter, the 95% uh, confidence interval is a little tighter than, than our smaller sample size, although the effect size at Cornell was 0.52 uh, more significant. Um, and so just to give you, a, a, I think, a, a preview of what Keith will talk about, this is really his patients um, at, at really looking at 70 uh, conventional radical prostatectomy, 70 retzia sparing, or as the residents here like to say, resident sparing uh, radical prostatectomy, finding that at 12 months, uh, the likelihood of continence as you measure it by uh, the expanded prostate cancer index clinical practice or CP, this was 98% continence versus 81% in Keith series. Although one could argue that these were the 70 that he did out of fellowship training compared to in a sequential fashion, 70 retzia. So they weren't even a, what's called a parallel prospective study. That is both were being done at the same time. Um, one of the things that I think that, that certainly the residents here and others have seen, you know, when you divide the dorsal, uh, it used, this used to be termed the dorsal vein complex alone, which Dr. Walsh described how to control this back in 1979. Uh, but when you divide this with laparoscopy and the insufflation pressures, you actually notice that there are you know, two pretty prominent arterioles here. And uh, so the question is, if you preserve this structure, which in uh, retzia sparing we largely do, you know, could that have a, a decreased effect or diminish the likelihood of penile shortening, Peyronie's disease, and those types of problems in men who undergo retzia sparing? And conceptually, you can see that here. That is, with retzia sparing, you're going to preserve the dorsal venous complex as well as the, the, um, the art two arteries here if you're in the correct plane. Uh, whereas, of course, those are divided when you uh, approach this through a conventional uh, robotic uh, uh, from above approach. And so we sent out surveys with validated instruments to query about these two things in Keith's cohort. Um, and you can see that at least there was no man who said that they had developed Peyronie's disease. Um, the penile shortening was pronounced in both groups, but 41% versus 67%. And of course, when you're not going through the space of Retzius, uh, these men are not at an increased risk of a, a hernia, and that has been published to be about 12 to 17 percent when you look at the um, stand, the conventional retropubic approach or the uh, for open surgery, as well as for uh, the the retropubic the retropubic approach for robotic surgery. Um, and so it, this also then uh, in multivariable analysis, at least for penile shortening, we find that uh, the retzia sparing approach had a markedly lower likelihood of uh, of penile shortening. So, so really that, that then led this preliminary data led to our recent uh, R01, which is, you know, aim one is to look at uh, differences in urinary and sexual function for retzia sparing versus um, uh, the standard uh, radical prostatectomy. Aim two is then to uh, compare uh, adverse events such as penile shortening, um, penile hernia rates, as well as um, uh, Peyronie's disease. And then aim three is to look at cancer control that is positive surgical margin rates, as well as the need for radiation therapy. Um, actually, I should have just gone to the next slide because here's the, here's the uh, conceptual framework. And so basically you can see that um, in terms of uh, the outcomes, we're measuring them out to 24 months. Uh, so, so again, uh, I, I'm kind of pinch hitting today for Keith, uh, but uh, his uh, work for Retzia Sparing certainly led the groundwork to this. Uh, again, it's a multi-center R01 that uh, we just submitted the just-in-time request for. So we're waiting to hear back from the NCI if they have any issues with our study design, but uh, having scored in the fundable range, uh, that should be another prospective study that we will be enrolling for uh, with uh, Doug Shearer as a co-investigator. So, so let me stop there. I think that um, you know this is a amalgamation of all the, a lot of the stuff that I've, I've presented previously um, at some of the grand rounds over the years, but um, Maybe timely, at least for the the residents, as they some of the residents number one as they think about their research year, and hopefully showing how some of those tools that I acquired during the research year I've just used over and over again. Um, and then uh, the other thing serendipitously that I didn't mention, for example, that I'll mention now, is the the importance of networking. For example, going to the AUA and keeping in touch with people. Um, Fernando Bianco was a fellow. He was actually on one of on that paper with. Uh, the differences in erectile dysfunction and urinary continence outcomes. Uh, but I met him when I interviewed at Memorial for Fellowship, actually. Uh, 
Uh, and um, we've kept in touch over the years. And I was at a, uh, a meeting in Miami and um, Fernando said, oh, hey, let's have breakfast. And this was again in 2016. Uh, he showed me on his iPhone, you know, doing a transperineal biopsy where, you know, he is inserting these uh, biopsy needles into the perineum. Uh, the patient was doing fine while awake. And it was just such a, again, an unconventional thing, given that the, the dogma in urology at the time was that transperineal biopsies needed to be done under general anesthesia. And so, so that's really led to the pathway of trying to do these in the office, uh, really getting a jump on doing, um, you know, as you can see, some of the work that's led to uh, funding from the, the uh, NCI as well as PCORI. And finally, um, the, the partial gland ablation work uh, for which the preliminary data is going to be helpful for uh, the, the, not only the, the PCORI funded study, but putting in another R01 probably in uh, February with the University of Michigan as well as with Lenny Marks at UCLA. So, so just the importance of keeping in touch with um, uh, folks and uh, getting ideas from others as well as collaborating with others um, Lenny actually mentioned to me and Jonathan on Saturday how his work with the Artemis started in 2009 when he was walking through the exhibit hall at the AUA. There you'll find, for those who haven't been, a lot of the vendors are there um, spending money for the space that they have and a lot of the innovative products are, that you can see there. That, that's really how he started his work uh, on uh, MRI targeted biopsy. And uh, now, of course, three R01s later for him, uh, he started a company and, and so forth. Uh, people fly in internationally to get uh, focal therapy with them. So let me stop there um, and um, and take any questions at 7055. So uh, thanks for allowing me to kind of pinch hit for Keith this morning. Well, good, we will let you guys get on to your day. You've heard this talk too many times before. Thank you.